Hello, everybody. Welcome. Glad to have you with me today. Today, we're going to talk about depression. We're going to talk a little bit about where depression can come from. There are a lot of different um, varieties of depression. I think it's a very broad diagnosis that applies to a lot of people in a lot of situations. And then we're going to talk about what we can do about it. Okay. So the term depression really is talking about something like this. Okay. That's a depression in the ground. <laughs> That's where we get the idea of depression. So I go into a space where I am someplace and then I go down someplace else. And then the, the hope is that I can come out of this depression and move into something else. I'm going to talk a lot about different things I've seen that cause depression. So the first thing, when I first got into the, uh, the industry, there was a lot of focus on the biological components of depression. So in the 1980s, there was a ton of research done on all sorts of things and pharmacology funded the research and also science just got better. So a lot of people wanna make pharmacology bad for funding the research and for the, the field going so hard into biology in the 1980s, but that's where the science was. That's where, that's where the exploration was and that's where things were really starting to get new and interesting. We had a lot of um, medications that came out um, and this is even back further than that in the 50s and the 60s but we had some stuff come out that could help people who really before that were, were really not able to be helped at all. And so that's one of the things we can talk about is the biological contributors to depression. So serotonin being low is a really common problem and uh, a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor an SSRI such as Prozac and uh, a bajillion other ones that came after Prozac um, what they do is they leave more serotonin in the brain, and as a result, you feel better. It's great fun. SSRIs are quite helpful. When I'm working with people with addiction, I'm always surprised by how many people in addiction are reluctant to get on an SSRI. I don't want to take pills. And I think, you've been shooting meth, you know? Like, it's cut with, with Drano, and you've been shoving it in your body for five years. Why don't you want to take an SSRI? And I also respect that for a couple of different reasons. One, I do think that long-term use of an SSRI uh, prevents resolution of some emotional stuff, okay? There are some material that you can't access on a psychological sort of cognitive level if you're on a long-term SSRI. And that was my case. I was on uh, an SSRI for about 10 years at one point. And when I went off it, it was uh, challenging in part because there was physical withdrawal, but also because there was a lot of anger and pain and sadness and all sorts of other things that simply had, uh, I simply didn't have access to prior to that. So when, I, when I'm working with addiction, people in early recovery, if I had my way, I would put everybody in early recovery on an SSRI for two years. And I tell them two years because um, the research shows that if you can be a slave to your recovery for two years, at the end of that time, your life will have changed dramatically. The people you hang out with, the places you go, and the things that you do for fun, your thought processes, all that stuff, if you stay sober, just the act of not using and not drinking will change your life dramatically in terms of who you want to hang out with, who wants to hang out with you, what you do for fun, all those things change. So for two years, if you're able to keep your mood in a place where it's okay, um, everything will change. And then if you want to, at that point, yeah, go ahead and go up. For most of the folks I work with, for a surprising number of them, the idea of having a timeline is very comforting. Okay? They get very concerned when they get put on an SSRI in treatment, they come out and they think, I don't want to be on a pill forever. And um, I, just, I just say, well, okay, let's, let's pick a time. Let's say for two years, you fix everything else. And after that, we'll let the serotonin start to do what it wants to do. And you can discover if there's some unconscious material or material you're not ready for right now that you can process later when your life is a little less averse to sobriety. The other thing that's been really interesting for me over the last couple of years as testosterone, um, uh, testosterone treatment has become more popular is I will have men, particularly men in their 30s and their 40s, who come see me who have depression and they, they talk about some of the typical symptoms of depression, the real emptiness right here in the chest, uh, a sense of not enjoying anything, decreased libido, all the symptoms. If you went down the, the symptoms of depression and the, and the DSM, they would, they would do it all. And I happened to be officing out of a naturopath's office, right? And this naturopath did my panels and I was like, oh, my testosterone's a little low. I'll, I'll supplement. And all of a sudden I felt like 
a million times better. And so I had a couple clients coming in and we've been working together and doing some uh, really decent work. And we've seen a little movement, but nothing substantial. I said, hey man, go get your panels drawn with a naturopath and see what your testosterone looks like. And they had done, this guy in particular had actually gotten his blood drawn with a regular doctor and found nothing out of the ordinary. With a naturopath, they test three different kinds of testosterone and a bunch of other stuff that I'm not that familiar with. Long story short, he ended up getting his hormones balanced again, and then he quit therapy, <laughs> which was fine with me because he needed he, he didn't need therapy anymore. He was feeling better. So that's the, the biggest thing about biological treatment of depression. Uh, when it's a biological depression and you treat it with biological interventions, a.k.a. Uh, hormonal rebalancing or SSRIs or some combination thereof, the diet change can really help. Some people are sensitive to sugar or, or uh, uh, wheat or whatever. When you, when you change the biological input into the system and it's a biological depression, you know what happens? They get better. <laughs> they get better. They feel better. Uh, oftentimes, pretty quickly. The SSRIs take a couple of weeks to kick in. Or I've had some clients who say that they can feel them after just five or six days, like from one session to the next. When they see a psychiatrist and get put on the SSRI right away, they can tell the difference. Now, things do get pretty gnarly if you put somebody who's bipolar on an SSRI. Um, then they go into a manic phase and start to think they can see through time and all sorts of other exciting things happen. But as a general rule, if we're looking for depression, when I have somebody who walks in front of me, I'm going to start to take a look at, to the best of my ability, because I'm not super trained in this area, but I'm going to explore some of the biological reasons, and I'm going to recommend that they see a doctor, that they see a naturopathic practitioner is my preference. Um, it's a bit more expensive and generally not covered by insurance, but their, um, their panels you know, are a bit more thorough in terms of looking for, you know, a doctor's looking to, to make sure you don't have cancer and to make sure you're, you know, you're healthy in general. A naturopath is actually doing things to adjust your mood. That's their idea to begin with. The doctor really doesn't necessarily have that intention from the get-go. So, so the biological component is a big piece of treating depression effectively. Now, another thing I like to do is to set this around here. When we're going to look at depression from a psychological perspective, The first spot we're going to stop here is with anger and resentment. Um, Alfred Adler is my favorite theoretician. I like, actually, I probably like Carl Jung a little bit better, but uh, you have to be pretty nerdy to really decide. Like, you have to have an argument between two of the founding fathers of psychology. Like, who's the better founding father? You'd be skippy, but. Uh, Adler talked about the idea with depression that depression is anger turned inward. So very, very frequently when I have somebody who's depressed, they grew up in an environment where turning your anger outward was dangerous, or it was frowned upon by the culture. Right? A lot of the women that I see grow up in environments where um, you know they, they're supposed to be good girls, and they don't get mad. They cry out their tears if they, if they do get mad. Uh, and so when I repress my anger, and I turn it inward, I'm going to end up with a bit of depression. I want to add a little bit to that, too, because that's sort of a simplistic explanation in terms of the, the process growing up. We have to remember that our, uh, we, as human beings, we have a fight-flight system, fight-flight freeze, sort of nervous system that's designed to, to keep us, to get us out of trouble if we get into trouble. And then we have an attachment system that's designed to put us into a tribe into first our, our initial family of origin and then our sort of larger community. And that attachment system does that because as human beings, we need a tribe to survive. We're a pack animal or a herd animal, depending on your perspective. So the thing to understand is if I decide as a kid, I might make a decision that expressing anger outwardly or expressing anger at people is not good for one of those two circumstances. It's not good either for my family or for my immediate community. It's not going to be part of my identity. So the challenge I'm going to have is that when things happen to me that are challenging or difficult, and when I do actually have some resentment, I'm just going to take that and turn it inward. Now, anger is the emotional equivalent to the thought, this is not fair. Okay? If you want to understand the emotion anger, people 
Um, and, and it's important that you understand that if you're going to work with somebody who has some depression, because you'll say to them, well, anger's, uh, depression is anger turned inward. And they'll say, oh, okay. Okay, do you feel angry now? No. How about now? Nope, still no anger. So what I do with somebody who comes in with depression is I say, well, tell me about your life. Okay, and they'll talk for a little while. And I say, okay, tell me what's the least fair thing in your life. What's the most unfair part of your life right now? What do you feel is not fair? And they get that almost every time. Somebody who's depressed, unless it's biological, somebody who's depressed always can tell you about what's unfair in their life. And that's where we start clinically. When something is unfair, all human beings, I don't know why, but for some reason, human beings, as a general rule, have some sort of expectation that life should be fair. And it's, as far as I can tell, not true. I've not seen a lot of evidence of that, particularly in nature. Biology does not seem to, to go in that direction. So this mistaken belief can cause quite a bit of heartache in our lives. And so a lot of times when I'm working with someone who's depressed, what we're going to work on is this idea of it's not fair. And to, to get into presentment, I'm going to take a page out of Alcoholics Anonymous and the big book, and we're going to talk a lot about what's my part. How do I find my part in this particular resentment? The reality is there are things that will happen to every all of us that are really not fair. We don't have control over that. And so this comes back to this idea of locus of control. Here's the person, here's their environment. My job is to point out the fact that yes, I understand that this tragedy happened, this challenging thing happened, and how you respond to it now is your choice. You always have an option, you always have a choice, no matter how awful it is, to respond to it in a particular way. And the evidence of that is that other people are responding to it differently than you are. Okay? Some people can go through challenging circumstances and uh, come out of it amazing. And some people go through challenging circumstances, fall apart. Make sense? The next piece that we'll look at is uh, actually kind of circling back to biological. But what we're really talking about here is uh, the fight, flight, freeze response in the brain. When we're talking about depression, what we're really discussing is the freeze response. Now, the fight, the fight response is part of this one. And the thing with anger, and particularly resentment, is it feels fantastic. Being a victim is delightful. It is so much fun to be in a place of victim anger. It's actually, it can even make you famous today. You know, it's a really very popular thing to do. Um, spending time Thinking about being a victim gives me a sense of significance. Human beings, as a general rule, loathe the idea of being ordinary. If you want to piss somebody off, tell them that they're pretty average. Tell them they're kind of boring. Sometimes I'll do that as a therapist, as a, as a uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, when, when, when stuff isn't working anymore, I'll, I'll start to throw out some interventions that are a little unorthodox and outside the, the box, and that's one of them. Well, this is all pretty ordinary, don't you think? Ah, oh, wait a minute, you like this, don't you? You're really kind of getting excited about this thing because it gives you a sense of significance. I have a client right now who I really enjoy and whose father was uh, pretty inappropriate sexually. Um, it's not completely clear whether there was uh, physical sexual abuse, but there was definitely what they call covert sexual abuse. So covert sexual abuse, is things like being exposed to sexual material before it's age appropriate, um, having your dad talk about your, your breasts or your buttocks or your shape, um, having your parents engage in sexual behavior in, in, a, in a sort of public setting or a setting where they don't uh, make an effort to sort of protect you from what's going on. Because again, prior to adolescence, uh, sexual material is pretty confusing and pretty challenging. So in this case, there's no question, no question that the dad was really, really off, off kilter. And one of the things she's struggling with is she, she finds a sense of significance from what happened. She really likes to be in a space of victim. And so that's what we're spending a lot of time working on. Because on the one hand, there's some power to that. On the other hand, there's also a sense of emptiness and loneliness and a real challenge with connecting with others. When 
the other thing that's coming up with this particular client as well is there's an awful lot of freeze on board. As a kid, you can fight, you can run, or you can freeze. Well, a lot of the time, fighting isn't going to work because you're little. Now, some people will fight anyway. I always have respect and kind of admiration for the scapegoat in the family system that says, screw you guys, and the horse you came in, I'm going to fight you no matter what. Um, the flight thing usually doesn't work either in an attachment situation. This is called complex PTSD. Because where are you going to go? Nowadays, we have DCS, I guess. But DCS, uh, teleprotective services, that's a mixed bag, man. There's a, there's a good shot that it's not going to go well for you. And you usually don't have the option that direction anyway. Nobody else is going to take care of you. You're probably kind of a pain in the butt. Kids are a pain in the butt. They're hard. They're a challenge. Nowadays, sometimes you might be okay. Back in the day, biologically, you know, if we look at our history as a species, um, a, a kid without a parents was in trouble. There's not a lot of folks willing to do, you know, the whole adoption idea, the whole orphanage idea is only a couple thousand years old. Prior to that, you just got to look. Freeze is a viable option. And freeze is when you stuff these down and you just kind of take it and make it work. And freeze is also associated with uh, denial or repression. And a freeze response in a complex PTSD situation can be um, uh, really valuable and valid to work with. These two things are pretty tightly connected. Okay. When I express anger, if I, uh, in my own household, if I expressed a fight response as a kid, it didn't end well. <laughs> and I learned that. So you know what I did? I stopped. When I got into my own recovery, I had a lot of this, a surprising amount, and I couldn't have told you about any of it. I thought everything was perfect. I thought I had a perfect childhood. I thought everything was great. I just had this problem I couldn't get rid of. I just couldn't stop engaging in behavior that caused uh, destruction and heartache to myself and everyone around me. Over the course of a couple of years in my own work, we started to figure out that this was involved quite a bit. So when we're working with a freeze response, um, meditation can be of great utility. Okay, And the other thing I need to do as a clinician is teach a person to name what anger is and feels like. And this, this is a big step in the right direction. What's not fair in your life? Okay, well, what do you feel in your body now? What's it like to be in this place? What's it like to feel anger? By the way, it's okay to feel anger. By the way, anger is a mobilization response. All injustice that has ever been created and then corrected in the world is corrected as a result of anger. Anger has some real merit and benefit. The other thing we have to do is we have to differentiate between anger and rage. Super, super important if I grew up in a household with rage. What's the difference, please, between anger and rage? I just think one's an emotion and the other's a behavior. Exactly. Exactly. Anger is an emotion. It's a physiological experience of activation in the nervous system. Rage is behavior. Rage is the action that sometimes can come with anger, but does not necessarily come with anger. If I grew up in a household with a rager, I will usually become a rager or become somebody who suppresses anger. Another client I'm thinking of right now is uh, an emergency response professional. Okay, who becomes an emergency response professional? Somebody who wants to be a hero. Well, guess what? There's crap tons of anger there, but he grew up with this. So all of it comes out sideways. In this case, he's working on a sex addiction, pretty gnarly sex addiction. Might cost him his marriage. We'll see. Okay. It's actually really, really common with, uh, uh, with when someone comes to see me with sex addiction, if they're a hero, it's um, kind of a guaranteed thing that they're going to have had some rage growing up and that they have anger that they're suppressing because they want to be a good guy or gal. Uh, integrating that part of the psyche back into the personal, personality is really, really helpful 
you know, being able to feel, express, give language to my anger, and allow it to process through, uh, and possibly even allow it to get me something that I want, is a lot of the cure for depression. So that's how we that's how we treat depression in a nutshell. Any questions? Go ahead. So we see somebody who has depression now, like maybe they have outwardly appear good now, like maybe have a good job, a fairly steady relationship, but they have a lot of untreated trauma from the past. They don't understand why there's depression now. Right. Would that be a thing? Yeah, absolutely. So the question is, um, can you have somebody who doesn't have very much that's not fair right now, but who had things that weren't fair in the past, aka trauma, what we all refer to as trauma from their past, and is that going to present as depression? Absolutely. Okay. I have a, another client I'm thinking of right now, and in this person's case, um, they had some really, really awful things happen to them in adulthood. I mean, really awful. Um, several times over the course of about 10 years, uh, every few years, something crazy awful would happen. Loss of a child, loss of a, a large scale in, industrial uh, situation, um, just, a, just really awful stuff. And then what happened is for a couple of years, nothing happened and everything was fine. And now what happens is I come out of freeze, okay, and I start to really feel this anger and resentment. And in his case, and that actually brings up the next thing, we're talking about grief. Unprocessed grief is a significant part of depression. Now, if we talk about the, the tasks of grief, and we don't, we don't have time to get fully into the tasks of grief for our purpose here, right? We have denial, anger, um, bargaining, despair, and acceptance. Somebody comes to see me and they're in depression, they're often stuck in here. They're often stuck in this top loop right here. The fundamental question of almost all pathology, really, no matter what, you, um, what you're treating as a clinician, one fundamental question is this thing here. What would I have to face if I let this go? One of the first questions I'm going to ask myself. And eventually ask the client, no matter almost no matter what comes across my front door, what do I have to face if I let this go? So if I've been in freeze, now my life is good for a couple of years, and all of a sudden this incredible pain and despair and depression comes up for no reason. No reason. I gotta look and see what would I have to face if I let this go. And in this case, if it's depression. The answer is almost that fourth task, which is despair. None of us wants to just sit in the despair and just feel the agony of our own powerlessness and impotence. We spend all of our lives trying to find ways to protect ourselves, when we discover it was all for naught. Right? That deep, deep sense of despair. And a lot of times some people say, I think I'll just stay depressed. Thank you. And that's actually a lot of what the counseling process is in this situation is coming to balance. So what, 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 what will happen and has happened with this client is we just hang around. I don't even have to do much. I just, I just hang out, listen, and wait for the despair to come. And the despair comes and it's excruciating and it's hard to watch. You know, it's, it's, one of those things where the pain is so, even talking about it and reflecting on it now, I can feel um, the emotion come up. It's some of the strongest I've, I've walked into in years, you know? Um, and then we go back and that's okay. You know, people people poo-poo denial. I like denial. Denial is the reason 
you can go back to work and do what you got to do, which seems kind of morbid to some people. But you have to remember up until again, a couple hundred years ago, if you're a farmer and your kid dies, have a funeral, put the body in the ground, and then go back out to the field so the rest of your kids don't die. That's the reality. That's the truth. We live, we forget, we live in such a soft world now. We forget how harsh nature really is. Yeah, so denial, I'm a fan. And, and pendulating, moving from that place of despair back into denial is a lot of what that process is in the beginning. Question? Well, I was just, I don't remember where I heard it, but I also remember hearing somewhere, like, you cannot process trauma at all, like, until and unless you are not being traumatized. And so, like, I feel like there's a lot, I mean, it's, it's losing a child, right? There's yeah. so much that kind of continually happens for so long right. that, like, once it stops, like, then you can kind of process that trauma and, like, the timeline is like, I don't remember where I heard that. Right. But I've used it a lot in reference to, like, COVID. Sure. You know, yeah. So. Yeah, we're all in the middle of processing COVID right now, you know, as a, as a culture and as a world. And we're, we're just starting to see the results of that, you know, in, uh, what is it, uh, June of 2021, we're just starting to see some of the psychological effects of isolating human beings for a year. Well, yeah, it's a great example. And yeah, um, while something's going down, denial runs the, runs the show, thank heavens, right? And think about it, I mean, you have to have a certain amount of resiliency under, under situations of tragedy, under situations of epic collapse, when you lose what's most important to you, you have to keep it together. Why? Because otherwise, because if you don't, now your family has two people to deal with. Somebody has to be there. Somebody has to be uh, there for everybody else, the people left over. Somebody has to be strong. And that might have been you. That might have been your client. And now, when the dust has settled, up comes the experience in the process. In the olden days, they would just drink a lot. You know, that's what that was. That was the therapy they had. I'm going to confession. You know, I think the clergy probably played a pretty significant role. I was I was uh, in a supervision with a woman named Pia Melody once, who's, who's <laughs> relatively well known, and she <laughs> said, <laughs> "Yeah." Oh, <excuse> me. <laughs> but but one of the things I'll always remember that she said was, "We're the modern clergy. You know, therapist is the modern clergy." Other questions? Go ahead. Yeah. I just got done with a group this morning. Yeah. We were doing respect versus disrespect and, and kind of people who do evil things to children came up. Yeah. And so we were talking, one one gentleman opened up wide open and talked about being willing to tell his story so that other people can feel comfortable. And another guy that's been there for quite a while now, who was always supposed to cross, actually did not talk about that. Oh, yeah. And um, so I, after after break, I said, well, we'll, we'll just turn the, turn the conversation in a different direction. But he actually came over and told me that he did not want to talk about his yeah. his therapist. He's been here for like four weeks now. Yeah. And um, and he's worried because his significant other is in treatment. He doesn't think that she's making progress. Uh -huh. And they get a child between them that he wants to protect. That you know, by avoiding dealing with all of that trauma. It's kind of, it's kind of, it looks like he's kind of locked in this depression mode, it's like he's not going to get out of it. That's it. Perfect example. What would I have to face if I let this go? Okay? Mm -hmm. What you'd have to face is the horror of what happened to you. And it's pretty horrible. Yeah. And those experiences, uh, the freeze response, uh, the, the space of being trapped yeah. is a really challenging place to revisit for everybody, for all of us. And it's normal to want to get away from that. When we get down to um, prior to emotional literacy, prior to understanding emotions and how they work, we really only have two emotions. We have pain, okay? And we have pleasure. And when people come into my office, a lot of times this is the basic level upon which they exist emotionally. And it sounds sort of pejorative to say it that way. Maybe it is, I don't know, but um, it's not very helpful. The reality is pain takes lots of different flavors. For a lot of us, fear, guilt, 
shame, uh, often, sometimes anger, not as much. Uh, are, they all get lumped in the beginning in the ear. And all the associated ones, you know, fear is anxiety. People don't say they're angry, they say I'm frustrated. Um, shame is humiliation. Guilt is a sense of uh, I did something wrong, etc. All that stuff is it's just this. So one of the things, one of the taps I'm going to have with a client like that is emotional literacy is to say, no, you're feeling shame, not pain. And shame, actually, if I'm willing to sit in it, we all come in with an aversion to pain and a drive toward pleasure. And what are the things that create pleasure? By the way, pleasure is not happiness. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Exactly. Turn on TV for like five seconds and you'll find things that create pleasure on a limbic system level. You know why? Because that's the shit people like to watch on TV. Otherwise, it's not very good TV. It's boring. Pleasure. So I'm going to go after all that stuff that the media and the world around me tell me is awesome. Except the challenge is sex, drugs, and rock and roll uh, have the potential to make you miserable and to de demolish your life and to take away everything you value. And ironically, processing your shame, sharing your shame with another human being, being willing to be vulnerable, right? Vulnerability is a side effect of shame. Being vulnerable, which is exquisitely painful and terrifying. And for a lot of the people that I'm working with, and for some of us in this room, for some of us watching, there's no previous experience with vulnerability being a good plan. Like zero. What's the worst kind of pain you can feel? Shame of being betrayed. And you were vulnerable with someone. It's horrible. And yet here we are. Oh, hi, nice to meet you. I know we've been, the, you know, real connected for like the last three weeks. Tell me everything that's awful about your life. Resurrect all of the stuff you tried. You, you spent literally, your entire personality is built around burying. Talk about that. <laughs> it's a tough sell. Make sense? And so that's the thing with this depression meal. There's a lot here. It's one of my objections. Objections is a strong word. It's important to realize that you're dealing with a pretty broad category when we start talking about a person who has depression. It's actually kind of convenient because pretty much anybody who walks, I don't like to get to into diagnoses and get all caught up with this or that. Or if I treat sex addiction, we can't actually, we have to pretend it's not a diagnosis in America because Lord, Lord forbid we offend somebody. Okay. So I can say, well, you're depressed. Well, yes. Are you depressed? Yeah. Do you feel empty? Yeah. You feel awful? Yeah. Okay. Which brings up the final point as far as treatment of depression. Um, the esteem model. Okay. Depression can sometimes be a function of what is traditionally called self-esteem. Most people don't have self-esteem. They have other esteem. That is to say, they get their sense of esteem from other people. How do I take somebody and offer them self-esteem? There's a couple things that have to happen if I want to have a decent self-esteem. The first thing is, I have to do esteemable things. That seems pretty intuitive, but it's really not. Okay? If I'm acting for pleasure in a way that's disingenuous, Okay. I feel for um, uh, some of these young people, I mean, I, I have a lot of clients who are engaging in sexual behavior with other people without being honest about their intentions. Okay. As you get a little bit older and get on the dating apps, you really have to sort of put up the pretense that there's some sort of future potential here. And when people do uh, lie about that in an effort to obtain pleasure, what are they doing? Well, they're shitting on their self-esteem. It's really, really hard to feel good about yourself if you're hurting other people. Super simple. A lot of depression, a lot of depression that walks into my office is really about making choices to uh, do harm in the name of my own pleasure. And we have a culture that endorses that in many respects. I'm going to get what I need. I'm going to sell dope so that I can make lots of money and have lots of nice things. Pleasure, great. 
not going to work well in terms of the self-esteem. At night, before bed, when you're by yourself, even if you're with somebody, eventually you're by yourself in bed, right? Who's there? Just you. Any questions before we wrap up? Go ahead. Question back to despair and yes. what you've seen in research, all of that. What is a healthy ish amount of time frame to bounce back and forth between denial and oh, great question. Despair, despair. before getting to acceptance. You're talking about grief. Okay, so in the context of grief, um, here's the, the interesting thing that we would have to actually do. We'll do a discussion of grief. Long and short of it is, um, I will, I'm, I'm careful with the client to give them an adequate amount of time. And then I look and see if there is a sense of payoff to it. Because there can be, again, the martyr thing. I don't know why I'm pointing up here because we talked about that in the context of this, but the martyr thing can show up and I can get hooked into the payoff being in grief. I have to be honest with myself about that. And, and as a clinician, I have to couch that in a particular way when I approach it with somebody. The other thing to remember is that it's not like, let's say my uncle dies and my dog dies. Let's say I'm five or six and I come out of a situation where there's no attachment in my family system. I get my needs met physically, but there's no, it's emotionally a desert. I'll tell clients that sometimes. I said, you grew up in an emotional desert. So yeah, but Greg, I was rich. Hey, I had one guy, he had giraffes and shit in his backyard, right? They had a zoo. Like they, had, they, were, they were super wealthy. Like their own giraffe and all kinds of just really interesting stuff. Complete desolation emotionally. Parents were just children. After your third and fourth generation of wealth, sometimes not a good deal. Things get pretty rough when you have no, when you have wealth for that long. Anyway, um, the, the emotional stuff is completely empty. Somebody gives you a dog. And the puppy loves you unconditionally and is with you. And it's, it's a nervous system that is settled, or a horse, good God. Uh, a one ton settled nervous system. Our nervous systems entrain the people and the animals. And, and if you're settled, if I'm in a room full of settled people, I'll walk in. That's if you ever go, if you're part of a religious community or if you go to AA and you walk into an AA home group with a bunch of people who've been in the same home group for a long time and you love everybody. You walk in and you can't hardly help but taking a deep breath. Sometimes you have to do it a couple dozen times before you get the hang of it. They call that asmosis in AA. And what they really mean is the consequence of being around a nervous system, of your nervous system and training to a room full of settled nervous systems. If you do this when you're a kid and your dog dies, it's awful. It is awful. Even I, had, I can think of somebody I knew who had a cat for 20 years. Well, shit. 20 years is a long time for a cat to live. The cat died when the person was an adult, and it was devastating. Devastating. It was the only real, sincere connection that they had had. So I lose my mom, and but, but guess what happens in our culture if your dog dies? You cannot take it to work. You can call in. You can call in that day. Hey, my dog died. I can't come in today. All right, see you tomorrow. Maybe, depending on your profession and who's around. Maybe nowadays you can. 50 years ago, I don't know. You were grief. It's, it's, so grief in our culture, and again, people want to make do a big make wrong about that. Look, that's okay. We, we you cannot, there's not a bunch of time to grieve on the farm. Go and harvest and do the farm stuff or your animals will die and then everybody's in trouble. So we're not gonna make wrong about that. And the reality is, as a culture, we don't do much with grief. Your dog dies, it's devastating, and you just got to keep going. Well, now all of a sudden your mom dies. And now the grief is really unbearable. But here's the trick. It's not just your mom, it's your cat. Maybe it's a couple cats. Maybe it's your high school girlfriend. Maybe you gave yourself wholly and completely to your high school girlfriend. And she just, one day it was done. And you decided, ah, oh, I'm fine. <laughs> So that's the challenge you get with grief. You can get several, uh, you can get complex grief where you're really grieving several uh, things at one time. You know, maybe you had a high school girlfriend you were in love with and you were gay. You guys had a secret. She sold you out. I find that happened to you once. 
That's a level of, that's a whole different level of betrayal and cheating, isn't it? Holy mackerel. So again, all that grief I walk around with, all of a sudden I sit, I sit down in the therapist's office or somebody dies or something happens or life is just good for a minute and things settle the fuck down for a minute. Or I get sober for about two years. That's my observation too. At about between the 18 month and two year mark, a bunch of stuff bubbles up. I always tell my newly sober people, hey, it's okay, you know, if you want to just live your life and do your thing and, and don't do much therapy early on, that's fine. Sometime before the two-year mark, make a connection with somebody, somebody on your insurance so you can hang out with for a little while. Because right around you hit that two-year space, man. Sometimes, not always, not for everybody. A lot of relapsing around that time. And the other thing that happens at two years is as whatever relationship you've gotten into has decisively normalized, often ended, but at least become miserable. And so you can't hide from, uh, you can't use that to hide from your stuff either. Go ahead. Treating depression, which is anger toward inward. We're treating the, the depression. We have yet to see the anger come up. Is treating the depression also going to clear the anger? Well, clearing the anger is is treating the depression. I'm sorry. Okay. So clearing the depression is treating the anger. I mean, it's they're they're the same. They're not going to tease out, is my I guess. Um, you know, so again, usually the this is not fair thing is going to work out. That's how you dig in. So if you have somebody who's depressed and they're not showing you any anger, the reason is because they're not connected with their anger because usually from a biological perspective, that was a terrible idea. So you can't just be like, feel some anger, it won't work. But if you dig into what is not fair in your life right now, what has not been fair in your life right now, oh, well, this isn't fair. Now, once in a while you get somebody who has no concept that something wasn't fair, and then we got to get into some psychoeducation about you know, what is trauma, what are emotions? I'll go into emotion management, you know, emotional literacy and kind of get into some of those directions. But as a general, you know, 95% of the time, that question, this idea, this concept of fairness is going to dig out what I'm resentful about. Okay. And then my job is to uh, experience the resentment, see the resentment, and start to really uh, put pen to paper. It can be really helpful. Journaling is super helpful. The other thing is, this isn't always a very quick process. When I have somebody, I was talking earlier about the, the type of sex addict that I run into a lot of the time who is heroic. And their life role, that's a two year process. Okay, right off the bat, I mean, we're just going to spend a lot of time kind of digging into that. They're going to have um, a lot of times they pick people who are controlling or who are difficult, who they can be heroes to, their partners. Well, they're full of rage at their partner. Okay? Particularly if they're into uh, porn or prostitutes, they hate women. They hate their mother almost always. That's oftentimes who they have to pretend everything was okay for. Them. Shit, they don't know any of that to begin with. And you can't tell them. They'll just think you're, you know, insight is outside, right? If I tell a client what I think is true, and again, all those things I said are generalities. Sometimes they're not true. So I can't just jump in and say that, but it's a pretty good bet a lot of the time. And so my job, again, is to just suss that out. What's not fair, man? Tell me more about your life. Just tell me, so why do you think you're here? What do you think you want? And now that's a little different to, um, if I'm working with somebody who's in denial of their uh, addiction or issue because of this. With depression, this is almost always going to get you. You do this, there's some biological stuff, and uh, we're going to make some progress most of the time. And the other things are nice too. All right, thanks for your time. Thanks for watching if you watched and listening if you listened. <laughs> and we'll see you next time.